Hey guys, welcome to another podcast of This Is Not A Car Wash. Now, today's guest, we have Jason Rose. I've known him for a very long time. We're going to hop in and ask him a bunch of questions specifically about his career and, of course, uh, his traveling and where he grew up and how he got started into detail. And we're going to go through all that. In future episodes, I'm sure we'll get into very, very deep, uh, very specific topics. But for now, uh, as I sort of get used to this program, quite frankly, and kind of getting back into the rhythm of podcasts, we're going to start off because I actually don't know a lot of these questions. So I think uh, having a good foundation is, is the place to start. So we're going to pull him in in a second. But since it's a new podcast... Here is the, uh, the, here's the place where I'd put uh, an ad, but I don't have an ad at the moment. So we're going to be going with the Ammo Training Academy. So uh, big thank you to the Ammo Training Academy. That guy is amazing. <laughs> so if you haven't seen it yet, uh, Ammo uh, 300 uh, series is really great. Um, I have 90 episodes. I worked uh, incredibly hard, uh, probably a year and a half or so of filming. And uh, we really talk about the behind the scenes of how to achieve uh, uh you know success quote unquote in detailing business and success for me is running a profitable business but not the biggest business in the world but profitability and so make sure you uh, you give it a check and uh right here this video will give you a kind of a promo of everything that's going on so there you go there's my uh, first ad and hopefully as the um as we get bigger we'll be able to have uh, some fun ads so without further ado let's hop in and chat with the man the myth the legend jason rose how are you sir very well, thank you. And you? Ah, very good. So, uh, sort of getting used to the new uh, the new layout here. Look, I'll go solo real quick. You see, we got a little Rage Against the Machine back there. Isn't that nice? You see that? And uh -huh. then we have this over the shoulder, uh, over there. We're we're still figuring <laughs> things out here, but uh, having a blast uh, nonetheless. And uh, it's nice to see you back in the states. So you've been traveling a whole lot, yes. Yeah, actually, the longest uh, international trip of my career, I just got back from Southeast Asia. Yeah. Um, we're going to get into some specific questions about uh, the difference between, uh, we'll just give a random example, U.S. polishing versus German or Southeast Asia, that kind of thing, to really see you know, where we are uh, in terms of uh, nationalities, or I guess countries, I should yeah. say, uh, the difference there. But before we get into that, I just wanted to lay the groundwork um, and I did this with Kevin as well. We talk about all these amazing things and the, uh, you know, pad compression and the, and the washer and all these other things that we can talk about for hours and hours and hours. We have plenty of time to do that, but I want to just back up because I, I can't believe I, you know, I've known you and, and, um, Kevin for such a long time. I've never asked like, wait a second, wh where did you grow up? Where did this whole thing get started? I should probably, I probably should have started with all of that, but I'm, I'm making up for it now. So, um, where, where did you actually grow up? How did you get into the whole detailing scene? Give me a little bit. I don't know if it's California or Idaho. I have no idea where yeah. you grew up. Well, um, thanks for touching on my least favorite topic. <laughs> We're going right for it, man. This is a this is a controversial. <laughs> uh, this is not a car wash podcast. So, starting off strong. Um, so yeah, I mean, born in Michigan. Oh. Um, you probably wouldn't have guessed that I one. I wouldn't have. Um, but then didn't stay at any one particular place throughout childhood uh, for longer than three or four years. So entire childhood uh, up until teenage years moved around from place to place. Um, so, you know, my dad was in into drugs. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh this is good. I'm glad we prepped this beforehand. <laughs> Pharmaceuticals, actually, oh. legal drugs. So, you know, his job was to validate uh, and get drugs through the FDA process. So they moved him around in his career. So my whole childhood, I was, you know, moved around. So Michigan, I'll, I'll just list some of the places I've lived Michigan, Illinois, South Carolina, mm. Puerto Rico, um, Texas, a lot of time in California and different locations in California. Got it. And then where did you start settling into uh, um, detailing? I'm guessing California. Is that like 18, yeah, so, 19 we're talking about California? Like you're 20 years old or like you're still 10? No. Oh, moved to California when I was 12. Wow. And then you stayed there 12 years old. until like, you know, adulthood. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much until eight years ago, actually. So the move to Denver, Colorado was to move to, to Rupus Company. Um, and I'm really glad to be out of California. Uh, we won't get into politics and uh, environment and all that, but very, very happy to have made that move. Mm. Uh, as you know, I'm an outdoor uh, enthusiast and a Jeep enthusiast. So being 
you know, this close to the Rockies is a, a great pleasure for me. Um, but yeah, um, adult life was mostly California. And I started actually detailing cars when I was 14. And it started with, you know, mom and dad's car. Uh, the neighbors noticed, uh, started doing neighbors' cars. And then that extended to their friends. And eventually I was doing a bunch of cars. And then, you know, they started throwing money at me. And I was like, oh, I could actually make money doing this. <laughs> did you ever have a transition from not detailing cars? Like, did you go, you know, I don't know, sell insurance and then we're like, oh, the hell with this. I'm going back to detailing or no? Yeah, actually, I had a 12 year mobile detail business oh, in okay. Southern California. Yeah, and, and during that time, um, very successful mobile business. But during that time, I put myself through college. So I you know, six years to get my four year degree because I'm slow. <laughs> um, actually, it's because I worked full time and went to school full time and it just took longer. Right. But when I graduated, I thought um, I thought it was appropriate. And what I should do is to stop detailing and go into the, you know, the area I studied in psychology. And I got, right. And I got I got six months into that and thought, OK, this isn't for me. So glad I spent six years to, in education, but uh, I was like, no, thanks. I think lawyers do that a lot. They're like, I want to be a lawyer and make this money. And they do the whole thing and they get out and they go to a law firm. And they're like, what the hell? Like, what I'm the not hell? doing this. This is not going to, this is not for me. I can't tell you how many lawyers I've met, how many lawyers I've met that have been like, yeah, I'm trained lawyer, but uh, you know, I, I do yeah. this or that for a living. So I think it's fairly common, but you have a what uh, undergrad or master's or something in something psychology? What's is it just psychology? I, I double majored in in psychology and human services. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I wanted to help people, and uh, I got six months into the you know the commercial and the business side of helping people mm -hmm. with you know mental health and things like that, and I hated it. I thought it was absolutely terrible. Um, I still think that you know that backside of counseling and therapy and mental health is just terrible um, from like ex exploitation or like taking advantage of people yeah or? yeah yeah the whole you know that you got to pay uh, you know because if you go back into generations ago the function of helping another person who is having you know uh, issues struggles events in their life or mental illness or emotional challenges that was that was grandma or grandpa or that was Uncle Joe that, mm -hmm. you know, kind of helped you through that stuff. Um, so the whole thing, the the money side of it just mm -hmm. really turned me off. I was like, this is really bad that the insurance companies get involved and there's all this cataloging of what people's situation is and labels and this label, label means that amount of money. And it just was terrible. I hated it. I always felt like, I mean, there's no secret. I think a lot of people have gone to therapy and, you know, from, from marriage to, you know, everything in between there's, there's a, various things I think that are important. I think therapy is wonderful. The one thing that I've always thought, uh, you know, in those moments were like, I feel like they're dragging this on to be able to keep the clock. I have a crazy sensitivity to lawyers, accountants, yeah. and, yeah. you know, those people that work on the clock and they're like, so tell me again how yeah really you're, i'm like Tell jesus i'm like get it out already it's like that's was like four <laughs> minutes worth four dollars worth of like you asked me the question like yeah. so uh no, you, i totally get what you're saying yeah. you kind of feel like you're in the you're in the taxi car then and you you've got a 10 minute ride but he's like driving around in circles yeah and we're gonna touch on <laughs> you know, this again it's... next week i'm like well why can't we just finish it today like i don't <laughs> <laughs> so stuff like that made me crazy um uh, there, yeah. thereby admitting I went to therapy, but anyhow, as you know me, I probably need a little bit more, but, uh, this is my, I I've turned to car washing as my therapy. Do you see how I did that quick, uh, that quick 180 right there? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so from there you left, I can understand why you wouldn't want to do that. Uh, you went back in, so you were, you were detailing for 12 years, mobile truck. I, I feel your pain. I know what you're talking about. Very profitable. Um, you know, having no overhead, yeah. cost of goods sold, et cetera, profitability, put yourself through school, went back in. I got this amazing degree. I'm going to go help people saw behind the scenes, behind the curtain, however you want to describe it. Kind of like, Ooh, this is not for me. Then went back yeah. to mobile or is this, I'm, I'm 
getting to the part where the part that I kind of know is is that Maguire's first or is that like what's the next? No, I went back. I went back to mobile, tried to put it together, and financially a huge challenge because as you can imagine, somebody who just graduated from college, um, I didn't take any student loans and I didn't take money from my parents or anything. So, uh, but I did run up some credit card debt, and so I I took the opportunity to run up some more credit card debt and <laughs> and buy equipment and buy a truck and you know get back into the business um and totally borrowed the money to do that it was the wrong way to do it but um yeah so i jumped back into it and i was all in it was exciting i it, it was validation for you know what i really want to do there's nothing better than going down a road and realizing that's not the road mm -hmm. At least doing and it quickly it. makes sense. That I, I felt the same way with the stock market stuff. They said, like, you're going to leave this job? This is crazy. You did all this education, all this thing to get to this spot. And I'm like, I want to do it now before I get five years in. And you're like, all right, whatever. I might as well just take yeah. the rest of the ride of the slide all the way down kind of thing. So I think figuring it out uh, earlier is obviously uh, advantageous. So that's, that's great that you did. Um, but I would imagine your degree somehow helps in you training people around the world obviously uh, it it definitely does help i mean the psychology and human services that that study does help um it also hurts in some ways because you know sometimes uh i get into overthinking things and um but the the whole process of going through college and achieving that goal and getting that done that that's all good stuff mm -hmm. I, I don't think it was a waste of time no i mean obviously um, not but you know not to stay in that field you know, some people might think it's uh, a waste, but I, I certainly don't because you're achieving something, you're going through the college, you're going, you know, you're doing all these things and, and you're, you're stepping up the ladder. I also think, because I, I mean, I can talk for 20 minutes about college. I think college is right for some people and, and not, you know, perfect for others, but I do think it gives you time to stay out of the system, the flow of the way the world is. You can kind of stay off on the sidelines, protect yourself, yeah. educate, and then just become more matured. Having said that, the flip side, for someone like me in particular, but maybe not a psychologist, a doctor, an accountant, uh, okay, like I, a lawyer, I, I get that that's probably advantageous to go through all that. For yeah. me, looking back, um, and I might be a unique character, I, I would have probably benefited more other than see, you know meeting my wife and, and that side of it, um, yeah. of just going to work. Because to yeah. me, as soon as the yeah. day that I left college is when like stuff got real. I was like, oh man, yeah. like, okay, there's no professor here. Like I'm late. The guy's like, I don't care if you, you know, you're fired, <laughs> you know, whatever. So I think that's when things got real in terms of um, educating yourself on how to actually function in society and, and to bring uh, revenue and what does revenue yeah. and, 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 and uh, profit actually look like. So I go back and forth. Maybe that's a topic for another day, but um, it's not a bad thing. I just, maybe, maybe I'll describe it as, as not as efficient as I would have liked it to have been in terms yeah. of my progression in where I am now. If I had not been in college and I started washing cars, in theory, I could go back and forth here. In theory, I would have had five more, four or five more years worth of experience in this category. But it's also, yeah, yeah. you're kind of gambling on that one. How the it's hell do chance. I, yeah, yeah, it's a chance. So yeah. Yeah. six and one, half dozen in the other. So anyways, you you finish, you go back to mobile detailing at this point. How far, how long do you do that? So you're, you're 12 years, was that the 12 years when it started? No, no, it was 12 years until 1991. Um, and I'm going to date myself here, but that's when I graduated and then uh, did six months in, you know, the mental health social work area mm -hmm. and decided forget that nonsense. Got back into detailing that same year. So I did that for four or five years, and I joined the McGuire's company in, in 1996 and was with that company for 20 years. And then how did you go from where you were to McGuire's? Was there like an open house or something? Or did Barry say like, hey, you're the man? Or No, when, when I got back into the business um, of detailing, I decided to get training. I went to training classes. And, Shocking. And they were... Um, the time that we're really putting on training classes um it it's not what it is today where there's like you can choose from 20 something training events to go to right now 
So I went to Maguire's training, got to rub shoulders with some of the Maguire's people. And eventually I uh, started detailing cars for employees at the Maguire's corporate office. So they became my customer. I'm feeling very Derek Bemis right now, if I'm not out of line. Does that feel very, is that? Oh, of course, yeah. He's uh, he's one of the several people in in the string of history that has is blessed and can claim to be the, the detailer for the McGuire family. That's crazy. Um, I didn't know any of this stuff. I didn't know yeah, that you so did I, it for them. I was one of the first. So Barry, up until when I started detailing Barry McGuire's cars, and by the way, I wasn't able to even touch his car until after like two years of detailing every executive and every other manager in the mm -hmm. building. Or we have an intern coming in. I think this is Jason's <laughs> name all over it right there. <laughs> so Barry had done his own cars up until then, but he just got too busy and you know, he gave me a chance and I started doing Barry's cars and, and then the family, you know, Nicole and some other family members. Um, but then David Silicon, uh, he was also one of those that uh, after I stopped doing it, he he started doing it. Derek Bemis is one of them. So there are several people actually that that can have that position in life that mm. they were they were Barry McGuire's um, private detailer. And so you became the private detailer, but at the same time you were working for them? No. Uh, I was an independent detailer when I was doing Barry's cars, and I would come by the McGuire's corporate office every Friday and spend the entire day. That same office doing... that I've been to, what's the name of that town? Yeah, in Irvine. Irvine, Irvine that's California. it. Yeah, that one, okay. Um, I'd, every week I'd be there all day, Friday, doing a bunch of cars, you know, whether it's anything from a car wash to a full detail on employees or Barry's cars or whatever. Um, and I don't know if I've, I thought I've told you this story or maybe on our podcast, but my, what, what caused, what was the trigger for me to, to be employed mm -hmm. at McGuire's right. was actually a pretty tragic event. Um, uh, I was, uh, you remember this? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, so I was at the, Irvine McGuire's corporate office on the Friday, like I was every Friday. And um, <laughs> I got a page. So this is good. <laughs> and then you went on your rotary phone and then <laughs> you picked up both the one on your ear the and the one like this. The pager was on my belt and it beeped off. <laughs> Hello? So I went to the, I went to the phone booth to <laughs> call them. Oh my gosh! Yes. Yeah, I'm not that old. I'm, I'm really not that old. Just, just to give you a little um, perspective, you're the, in the realm of this story. I was 10 years old. If that makes you feel better. Oh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mm -hmm. make me feel better. You, you can continue um, now <laughs> with your so self-esteem high. I got a page. I got a page. I went into the McGuire's corporate office to make a phone call, and I came out five minutes later and all my uh, truck, my brand new truck, all my brand new detailing equipment that I had spent a lot of money on a credit card to buy beautiful. I set up this beautiful detail rig. It was like show car quality. What was expert. it by the way? Do you remember? It was a, it was a full size uh, Ford uh, pickup truck with a, with a whole slide in bed that had all my details. So you could literally uh, go in the back and do the thing with the rails on it and then pull it out. Yeah. Oh, slide cool. it out. Yeah. Cause I, you know, I was riding dirt bikes at the time. So on the weekends, that same truck, I would slide out my detail rig and put in my dirt bikes. And so my truck was multi-purpose at the time. That's cool. Um, yeah, it was very clever. Um, it turned my truck into a business during the week and then, you know, play on the weekend. Um, but anyway, I came out, everything was stolen. The truck was gone, my detail rig, everything that was gone. They had done it in such a hurry. They left, they disconnected the, the pressure washer hose and just left it laying on the ground and just took off. This isn't a matter so, of like five minutes or something, right? Five minutes. I went in to make a phone call, came out, it was gone. So they're definitely watching you because that would be a weird chance of... Let's just randomly yeah. go up. You know what I mean? Somebody's like watching, like he's gone. Let's go kind of thing. That's crazy. Pretty sure I was being cased out. Um, but I was in the parking lot of the, you know, McGuire's corporate office. Like I'd been there every week. Um, so anyway, pretty, um, 
majorly inconvenient. I would say tragic at the time because, like I said, I I didn't own most of that stuff. I had bought it on credit card. I just was starting my business like over again uh, from nothing. And, uh, you know, so I owed money on this truck. I owed money on all, every bit of equipment I had in the back of that. And I bought top dollar. I bought the best I could buy. If I, if I needed a generator or a pressure washer, I bought, I bought the best, mm -hmm. you know? So I had tons of money in this stuff and I got my first lesson in car insurance. And what I was told was that anything that was not bolted down to the truck Oh, is not covered. It's personal items. Yeah. If it wasn't bolted to the truck, it's not covered. Is that and today, nothing you was think? Because, because I had everything on this slide-out tray. Oh. Oh, that's a technicality. So, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I could talk for two hours about insurance stuff, the stuff <laughs> I'm going through right now. That I That totally makes sense. If I'm going to go off on a tangent here, but if you don't read the policy... Yeah. You you can have so many issues. Uh, finish the story, and I have like five. Uh, yeah. Insurance is designed to try to wiggle off the hook. And before you do any home insurance, uh, health insurance, uh, medical waivers, playing baseball, which I'll talk about, if 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 there is the tiniest little gap, they can slide right through, it and they know it because they didn't pay. Yeah, they didn't. Re yeah. So you're saying that after all that stuff, you got replacement for they took the truck too, obviously, right? They took the truck. So you got replacement of the truck and, you know, whatever was bolted down, which I'm sure was nothing or minimal. Nothing. It was nothing. It was literally a tray that slid out. And, you know, little things like I had this um, uh, bolted down thing that held my laptop in, inside the cab of the truck. So that was covered. The laptop wasn't. But my, my little cradle thing was covered because it was bolted to the truck. It was just... A terrible lesson to learn because uh, here I had all these uh, bills. Um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not ashamed to say it now. It was just a it was just bad bad timing. I was starting a business. It was my very first year of a restart. Bought everything uh, on credit and. So what is the actual lesson here? From what I'm understanding, and then correct me, the lesson is don't buy anything on credit. Buy a little bit as you go and pay cash for it, yeah. I guess, and then maybe read. Which is, I know people are like, dude, really, I'm going to read the 35 page thing. I know it sounds ridiculous. We're going to have a whole other topic on this. No, yeah, no, you should actually you gotta, read the 35 page policy. Sorry. You got to understand the fine print. Yeah. Have to understand it. And then, yeah, and yeah, the way that I started probably financially was not, you know, smart. I could have, I could have uh, grown into it, made some money, and bought bought up to the equipment. You know, maybe bought the minimum needed. Mm -hmm got the thing going and then grew grew and bought more equipment as i went that would have been smarter right but uh that's not how i did it i was i was really excited actually to get back into detailing and i just went all in and didn't have money at the time because i was a college graduate I just literally graduated had no money all right so this guy steals it from you do you go into like some depression kind of thing the obvious answer would probably be yes or did you call like oh my gosh. Or like what happened? i was i was in shock and i didn't know what to do call the police yes um, right. oh yeah yeah i did that part um but uh and actually i don't think i've ever voiced this to anybody so you're the first one i've shared this with but when you said depression i was like it was it's deeper than that uh, not only was it depressing, but the, the following several weeks after that, because at the time, I didn't have a place to live. I was living at a friend's house on a couch um, because I, I started a business, had no income, no capital, no money to start a business. So I didn't want to have like an apartment cost or housing cost. I, so I stayed at a friend's house. Well, Long story short, and I don't need to go into details of that, but that person kicked me out, and I was homeless for three weeks. Or without a car. Yeah. I was homeless. I was bouncing around from, you know, friend to friend, and I borrowed a, a car from a friend when I needed to get somewhere, and so it was like, yeah, you can you can use a car, but I need it back tomorrow, and so it was just a crazy. A uh, terrible time for like three weeks. It was absolutely terrible. <clears throat> I had no idea of any of this stuff. No, nobody does. I did, I haven't shared this uh, to too many people, but it was just a um, 
I mean, you got somebody pulled the rug out and you just literally got smacked on, on your face on the ground and like, what the hell do I do now? So the police were investigating, trying to figure out where the car is and all that, and they hadn't found it. Um, but I get what changed my life, actually. This was a life-changing phone call, and maybe you've had one of those in your lifetime. Some people listening might have had a phone call, a conversation that changed their life. This phone call changed my life. I got a call. Um, <laughs> it was actually a page, and then I called somebody. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was Nicole McGuire. And Nicole was in tears, and she said, oh, my gosh, I heard what happened. It's terrible. Um we just can't believe this happened to you and you're such a good person and we want to help you. So she had offered on behalf of the McGuire family, we are going to help you get back on your feet. We're going to help you get a vehicle. We're going to help you get the equipment you need. I mean, compounds, pads, and machines, that's not a problem for us. We'll get you whatever you need. We are going to help set you up to get back into business today right now hmm. and amazing phone call and I, I can feel it in my eyes now I was in tears then I was like what I mean nobody nobody does that to people right it's like that's it's such a, a amazing offer and I felt it it was sincere I know they they would have done whatever it took to get me back in business and they would have worked it out I would have made payments to them or whatever but um it was such a strong, compelling, powerful offer that at that moment, as I'm sitting there talking to her, I decided I wanted to work for that company. Um, and as much as I love detailing, I had also felt like I got 12 years into it and uh, I wanted a next level, you know, that next level thing that some detailers actually get to that. They're like detail for... I think it happens like more than seven or eight or 10 years. You get into it and you're like, okay, what's what's next? What's mm -hmm. the next thing I can grow to? So I had felt that and I'm like, I want to I wanna go uh, to the next level. Uh, so I declined Nicole's offer. I said, I, I appreciate it a lot, but I really want to just work for your company. That's what I'd love to do is just work within your company. So that started a series of phone calls with different managers. And I knew a lot of people at the McGuire's corporate office. So it started a lot of conversation going. And the answer I got back from the, at, at that time, the national sales manager at McGuire's, um, the answer was, uh, uh, sorry, we don't have a position for you. You're, you're, you're just a detailer. That is so and, crazy to hear that. I, I, your story is nuts, but I don't know why. For some reason, that is like the craziest part of the whole entire story. Yeah, I was told no. I was told to, uh, they're like, I let us buy you, you a truck, you idiot. I, you, we don't want you <laughs> around every day. What are you crazy? <laughs> That's nuts. So they said, we don't have a position for you. Um, you're a detailer with no distribution experience, no commercial experience, no sales experience other than selling detail services mm -hmm. so they said you're not not only do we not have a position for you you're not qualified for our entry-level position in the company um so obviously that was a blow i'm like oh cool i just turned down their offer to bail me out and then now i don't i don't have a, a job this is great <laughs> this is a classic so here it, okay it continued on for uh you know, another two to three weeks, I think, maybe even as much as a month of just floundering, wondering what the heck am I going to do? So then I get another phone call from uh, the national sales manager at McGuire's, and he said, you know, we don't have position and you're not qualified, but if you want distribution experience, I have a hookup for you. I can get you employed in Dallas, Texas. And you can be a distributor of Meguiar's products in this company in Dallas. And that would get you the experience that eventually you could join Meguiar's. Like, cool. 
I mean, I ha I want you to remember this. I had no house, no car, <laughs> no money. And here's a job offer in Dallas, Texas. I'm mm. like, okay. <laughs> Literally nothing to lose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, odd day that was because that same day I got that phone call and then I called for a phone interview with the company in Dallas and I accepted the job and then I hang up the phone and I'm like, cool. I have no idea how I'm going to get to Dallas. And Texas. you're in Southern California right now? I was in Southern California in Huntington Beach. Um, at the time, because I was homeless, I was living in one of my parents' friend's house that he was selling his house and it was empty. It was like for sale. So you're like, but I was half I was squatting. staying there yeah. as a, as a security guard, and I would show the house when somebody came to see it. <laughs> this is our guard dog, Jason Rose here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I had my backpack with my bedroll and sleep in at night. I'd roll it out. It, literally, no furniture in the house. It was completely empty. Um, so here I am. I hang up the phone. I'm like, cool. I accepted this job. I, I, they're like, when can you get to Dallas? I said, well. It's I'm a long exactly walk from sure, here. <laughs> I'll get I'll get there as soon as I can. <laughs> um, weird. So, but the same day, I get the call from the police department, and they said, we found your truck. And it's completely stripped down to the bone, down to the frame. I mean, it was totally stripped. It had been sold for parts. Uh, and that's when I'm like, oh, well, shit, how, you know, what do we do? You know, what's the next step here? So anyway, long story short, that truck got into a shop. It was completely rebuilt. And in a week's time, I had that truck back. Who's paying I for this? Turned... Insurance. The insurance company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got the truck back. I turned the key and I drove to Dallas and it actually was two years that I worked for that company in Dallas and they were one of the largest Meguiar's distributors in the country, but based in Dallas and they had route trucks and a store and all this stuff. I had great experience learning how to sell, you know, detail products. That's where I started learning how to sell stuff rather than sell detail services. Mm -hmm. I was selling detail products, tools and equipment and all that stuff. But I did. I was there for two years, and every three to four months, I would, I would call McGuire's. Hey, uh, I I got experience now. Um, I'm doing distribution. Do you have a job opening? And they would say, No, not yet. We don't have anything. So I got into two years, and then one of those phone calls, they said, You know what? Yeah, we do have a position for you. And it was very entry level sales into the McGuire's team. And I accepted and moved from Dallas back to uh, Huntington Beach and Irvine area for, for the McGuire's job. So I literally started entry level at the lowest position they had in the company. What, do you, what is that? What do you do? Like, what are you doing? I was in, it was territory sales. In so, like, Southern literally California. going out in, your, in the truck that they provided or whatever and being like, hey, I'm Jason. Yeah. This is ABC detail shop. Do you need yep. that, that kind of thing? Doing demos and taking orders and all that stuff. That's how I started my career at McGuire's entry level sales. And then fast forward. So from there, where did you, what was the top thing before you left to go to Rupes? You were the head of global. Oh, I, I had gone through different positions in sales. I had uh, promoted up to sales manager. I had a five state territory all in the West. And then I had four guys working for me at one time. Uh, so I graduated up in sales. Uh, I got out of sales 10 years into it and got into the more technical side, products, training, tech service, that sort of thing. And then in that 10 years grew to be their global director of training and I was coordinating their training program globally. I think right around then, maybe three or four years before you left is when you and I finally actually yeah. met, I, I think. Because I know you were still working for McGuire's, so there's no doubt. Even when you call me today, I don't know why, I, I'm just ridiculous. You're, I still have the picture. I took a picture of you leaning against, remember the uh, washing machines in the um, the downstairs of McGuire's? Uh -huh. The two big ones, and then like there was like a like a cabinet or something behind it to the, yeah. you're leaning on it like this and you have your McGuire's jacket on. And I don't know, I just was <laughs> like, boop, I took a picture and I was probably sending it to Kevin to put like, 
like boogers in your picture or some right, I was trying right, to do something yeah. ridiculous and then it's just, it's been in my phone for like you know, whatever 10 15 <laughs> yeah years. you and Kevin both because Kevin when I call him he says hi Jason from McGuire's because it's <laughs> he still has the Jason <laughs> McGuire's on his phone <laughs> yeah so that that's all right funny. I I can't believe that's that's intense I did I had no idea I wouldn't have uh well it's stuff that I'm not super proud of and it's not like i'm not ashamed but it's just something i went through and uh i haven't told the story to too many people mm. now I, I appreciate you saying it i do i do think it's not you know the saying it's not where you are you know where you go it's the, you know the, the where you've gone you know from beginning to end it sounds like i don't know how much lower you could have gone than you know yeah squatting in houses and, and so on and so forth so uh, that's that's an amazing story and legitimately i I had no idea, so I appreciate you saying that. I, I wouldn't have pried at that, but <laughs> making a hell of a podcast. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I was just like, yeah, let's just talk about your background. You're like, sure. I was like, all right. I didn't. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, so at this point, you're a couple years in. You and I know each other. I remember sitting in the, the you know, say as much or as little as you want, but it, it is in fact the truth. So I remember sitting in the basement of McGuire's. Um, and walking around and then the, the, just kind of briefly uh, go from McGuire's to how Rupes uh, sort of came to be. You're 20 something yeah. years in, time for a change kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, I was 20 years into um, McGuire's. And uh, as many of you know, the company was acquired by 3M. And um, the company culture internally changed. Um, it It took like three to four years, but it dramatically changed the whole company. From what to what? And, well, the, I mean, McGuire's family owned and operated and Barry was like the one that ran everything. And, and they would like help people out who had their trucks stolen and buy them new trucks and things oh, like yeah, that? Oh yeah, it was stuff like that. It, it was it's just pretty good example. family oriented. Yeah, um, values and all then, that. And then it switched from that to a massive um, corporate identity and corporate uh, culture inside and uh, as you can imagine 3m being you know global and multi-billion etc but they their highest priorities and values were not aligned with mine personally mm -hmm. so their priority is serving shareholders on a quarterly basis quarterly that's, earnings yeah got it that's what they do it's all about that quarterly and they're great statement. at it. oh fantastic i mean They've that's why a, they're 3m they just yeah and you know what, more power to them, that's a thing. And I, I just didn't want to be in the middle of that. And uh, it didn't, it wasn't fun anymore. And uh, I decided actually on a Friday, I have told this story, I, I think you've heard this, but on a Friday afternoon, I decided that's it, I'm done. I'm, I'm moving on to something else. And over the years at the SEMA show in Vegas, you know, I have companies walking in, tugging me on the shoulder. Hey, if you ever, if you ever think about making a change, mm -hmm. you know, give us a call, let us know we're, we're here. And I always say, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, Cause I was, I'm very loyal. Uh, but at that Friday afternoon, I decided to make three phone calls. And these are three companies that in the past few years had told me hey, we're open to talking to you about coming on board with us if you want. And these are three companies that I thought, uh, you know what, they kind of aligned with what I want to do. They're family-owned, run businesses and um, kind of the, you know, the culture I would like to be in. And I was excited about their products. So I made those three phone calls on a Friday afternoon. I didn't expect any response from anybody until the, the following week, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I got one return phone call on Sunday morning. I remember I, I called Friday afternoon. I got the second call Monday morning and the third call Tuesday morning. And by Wednesday of the following week, I had job offers from all three companies. That's a testament. Which is, which is beyond what I expected. I'm like, this is crazy. Um, so they, you know, literally pounced and, uh, um, uh, I accepted, uh, after some negotiation, I accepted what was going on at Rupus cause I was really excited about the Bigfoot polishers at the time. And, um, even though I was at Meguiar's, I was kind of like a closet Bigfoot polisher user, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> like a lot of people were, 
Um, but yeah, and then that 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 was eight years ago. Is it eight years? Eight years ago. And I haven't looked back. It's been exciting. Still, family owned and operated business. And, Pri privately, you know, held, yeah. they're not. Uh, yeah, they're not publicly held, so they don't worship uh, the shareholder. Um, and you know, family-run businesses, you still get the family dynamics, and it gets weird sometimes, and it gets goofy. But I prefer that chaos and that crazy drama. I prefer that over worshiping the shareholder quarterly statement. And then you moved, obviously, from California to Denver. Yeah, you're in Denver. To Denver, yeah, yeah. Denver's, yeah. Denver's beautiful. Which is a great move for me personally because I'm. I just love the outdoors and i love all the jeep activity in the rockies so i'm happy happy ending i like it i like <laughs> it a lot so uh I, I i again i my apologies i had no idea about any of that stuff but i do appreciate you sharing it i wanted to um just kind of get the background because honestly i didn't i've never known any of that stuff and, and i think it's a good place to start for a podcast but um you know obviously i Whew, I need to I need to uh, take a break after that. That was intense. So um, I'm gonna transition into the uh, the question that you know you and I talked about before we got you know in the green room beforehand. Uh, something I'm very fascinated about is the difference between um, how detailing is perceived here. It was certainly my why why I started ammo the whole nine yards. I just I feel like yeah. I call it throw the keys. You're like you know I came from fancy jobs in Wall Street. Everybody kind of knows my background, and then I did this. It's like ugh. And even to today, maybe not so much today, but maybe three or four years ago, five years ago, you know, you walk around with your kid and other, you have, now you have to meet other yeah. parents. And so what do you do? What do you do? And I go like, I wash cars. I, I don't know. Like, you know, yeah. it's like hard to, they're like, oh, okay. You know, oh, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> good. Uh, you know, I'm a CPA. I'm a this, I'm a that. I wash cars. <laughs> so I've always had a bit of a chip on my shoulder. What's my point? My point is, how is it perceived differently? Because I don't, get, I don't travel. I am going to Australia soon, which I'm pretty pumped about. Um, but you've been literally everywhere. I can't even imagine what your passport looks like. But you've been everywhere teaching people for years and years and years, 20 years plus or whatever it is. What is the difference between the U.S. and the perception of detailing versus everywhere else? And is it versus everywhere else or is it specific pockets? Like Southeast Asia thinks about it this way. Germany thinks about it this way. But can you talk a yeah. little bit about the differences sure. in perception. Yeah. I am blessed to see detailing uh, from a lot of different perspectives and in a lot of different cultures, a lot of different countries. And what I've observed is that there are some uh, similarities in detailing that are global, they're universal. And those are, those things are, are things like uh, passion for uh, caring for a car that is universal. I see that everywhere. Now, whether you're a car owner or a professional detailer working on other cars, um, there is a passion for detailing. And I see that in every country I go to. There's, it's everywhere. So that's one similarity that you'll find. Drop me, drop me in Canada. Go to you know, South Africa. Go to India, China, wherever. You drop me anywhere in the world, and I will find detailers that are passionate about detailing. It's just everywhere. Mm. Now, the major differences are um, tied and linked to labor rates. So the perception um, of detailing and the status of detailing, if you will, uh, varies from country to country. And it is really tied to uh, the cost of labor because Detailing, let's face it, is is a, a labor-intensive activity. Sure, it's physical. So, what does that physicalness cost? Uh, it's different in Switzerland, which has very high cost of of labor. Uh, people who work on cars, whether you're a painter, a detailer, a mechanic, whatever, that person is very expensive. It's a very high hourly rate for that person jump over to India and that person working on the car is very inexpensive. It's very low cost of labor. For example, in India, the, the price tag of a bottle of wax for that price, mm -hmm. you can buy, you can buy a human being for a week 
and have them wipe down your car and do whatever you want for a whole week. Really? That's how that's how that's how low cost the labor is. We're talking like very pennies. very inexpensive labor. Yeah. Now, I just got back from Southeast Asia where we did a massive campaign around six different countries and in lots of parts of Southeast Asia the cost of living is, is or cost of labor is very low. So detailing kind of takes on a different thing. Um, when when a car needs to be machine polished in let's say Sweden or Switzerland or Norway, it's it's one person highly skilled with the best equipment. They need to get it done right that first time because a redo is very expensive. Mm. So it really is a lot of preparation and education and training and equipment and get everything right that first time because if it's a redo you just blew the profitability on that car yeah in right? norway when i went with you guys it very much felt like technician is the word that i would use they were just like, very technical they are highly st paid stature yeah. there was like this everything was right yeah. and perfect and polite and i was like wow i mean norway's beautiful you know just on its own and the people are absolutely amazing and for some reason all of them are incredibly happy i, I don't know what's going on there but yeah <laughs> these people are just amazing but i just remember talking to the norwegians and going like man like whoa like we, yeah when you're talking to them it's very much like you're talking to a technician Correct. or a doctor right or, i mean you you feel like you're talking to a very educated, very intelligent, very savvy, professional person. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the way it has to be because the labor rates are really high. There is, There cannot be such a thing as keep redoing a car to get it right. That doesn't happen in Norway. It doesn't, doesn't happen in Switzerland. Uh, You've got to get it right. And that's why even painting cars, it's those are very technical expert people that know their craft and are... And so what do you think about the U.S.? Like, why is the U.S. seemingly, unless I can, I'm speaking out of turn, is not as high as Norway with respect? No, U.S. market is somewhere in between. Uh, if you think of, you know, the low labor rate countries where uh, a human working for an hour is very low rate. So if you take that same situation, for example, in the Philippines or Thailand or uh, uh, Malaysia, um, if a car has to be polished, they can throw five people on it hmm. and have that car done in an hour. I mean, and and that's how detailing is done there. There's there's literally at a detail shop. There's probably twenty detailers, <laughs> and they bring a car in the garage and they're like, "Jump in there, let's do the inside and the outside." So. 20 people jump on this car all at mm. once. You got people crawling on the inside and people on the outside. And and, and that can happen because of the, the labor rates. Labor rates. Mm. It would mm. be impossible to do in Norway or Sweden or Switzerland. And, and impossible in some parts of the United States. You can't, you can't throw that many people on a car and be profitable. profitable. Yeah. Right? So it does take on a different thing. And I had some weird experiences as we're talking about this. I'm, I'm remembering um, a training campaign in India that I went to. And I, I went there uh, feeling and thinking and expecting that I'm going to be training detailers. And I wasn't. Um, oh, this also happened in, uh, in Dubai. Same, same detailing culture there. So... I got there and I'm training owners and managers of detail shops that never touch a car, which was weird to me because I'm like, I'm, I'm trying to train a person that's actually not going to be doing the work. Well, how does it? Okay. But I was told I can't even talk to that person. I can't deal directly with the detailer that actually works on cars. First of all, there was a major language barrier. They were Pakistani immigrants or whatever. Um, and secondly, they don't, it's not part of the culture there. They don't, they don't get the direct training. What happens is you train the owner, the owner then trains his people. And then he supervises his, his people. That's how that works. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to buck the system. It's just something I had to adapt to. 
but it was very weird for me training somebody who I knew ahead of time was not ever going to touch a polisher, not ever touch the car. In that instance though, how, who sets that training up? That's, I go back to like, wait a second. Is that, do people like call Rupes and say, I, I want Jason to come to XYZ event, or is it just an event that you show up at? Like how? How would that come to be? I don't even understand. Like even in well, Southeast Asia, like how did you go there? Like, yeah, a lot of these owners and managers are on social media and they see somebody's training name and they see this American, this American trainer coming over. So they they contact the distributors of the products that supply in that uh -huh. country and and they're like, hey, set me up with this guy. You know, I want this guy to come mm -hmm. and do a training. So it's either a group, we set up an event and we invite them in. But even then, I'm, I'm sitting there talking to 50, 60 people, and they're all owners and managers of a shop that are never going to touch a car. The weirdest thing for me. And so I, I guess maybe one of my last questions, what would you say the difference between online training versus in-person training? Like what's the, so like I, another way of saying it, couldn't you just have like an online Hey guys, I'm Jason from blah, blah, blah. How you doing? Like, yeah. is that easier than like flying to these crazy places and like, Oh, for sure. For, uh, and when you think of efficiency in the, in the business side of training, right. it's no question. You got to ship all the still... stuff there, don't you? Oh, well, no, I have local teams. We have, you know, distribution networks, every country in the world. So when I, when I drop myself in that country, there's already a team of people, there's already tools, there's already, so I, I can just drop myself in and do an event and have everything I need around me. Um, I rarely ever fly uh, with anything as far as tools and demo stuff. Mm -hmm. I just land there and it's all ready. Um, but they prefer but, to see you versus like an online thing. I mean, obviously everybody would prefer to see you, but I'm saying it makes economic sense or it's most efficient or effective or what, whatever Rupes decides. Like why? I just, I just seems no, crazy no, to me that you're flying all over the world. It's an interesting question because I, I've actually, um, your name comes up a lot when I travel, especially around Southeast Asia and Australia, which, you know, you're going to soon. Mm -hmm. A lot of those folks are your fans. I hope you know that. Um, but when I go to a class and I hear, uh, oh, I watch all your videos <laughs> and I, you know, I, I watch everything you do and a little bit of Q and a with them. And I find out, you know, because I don't have my own YouTube channel. I don't have my own videos. I don't, I've spent my entire career being, being a guest or a feature of somebody else's video. So I always ask, I said, okay, I, what videos are you talking about? Cause I don't have my own channel and they bring up your name and they're like, Oh, I watch all of the ammo videos with you and Larry and um, Kevin and, so it makes me think, you know, when you think of this online training thing that, okay, so here's somebody who has taken the time and sat there and studied all these videos that you've produced and put online. Mm -hmm. And, and then they also pay to go to this training event that I show up at and I'm, and I, and I'm delivering the same message. <laughs> You know, th this is how you polish paint, and I'm delivering that same message that they got on videos. So it makes me think: Are we, are we just terrible at our videos? We suck. And, no, I, I but... can't believe you're bringing that up because I'm having the same thing. I'm just, like, the podcast is about being honest and open, blah blah blah. So I did the ATA 300. I spent like a large portion, I feel like, of my life developing these. Like, how do you actually make money? What does a P and L look like? Let's talk to lawyers. Let's talk to accountants. What's branding? Yeah, yeah. What kind of clothing should you wear? How do you address people that are worth a billion dollars? How do you not address? The, I mean, down yeah. to the minutia, uh, at the very minimum of how I built my business. We've, you know, we've had a couple of students. No doubt about it. It's been great. But like every single one, I the training. Where's the training? I want you to be in training. I was like. It's right there. Like you don't even have yeah. to get on a plane. It's all, I just did. It's right there. Yeah. I have it. Yeah. And I can see, I'm not saying no one's doing it. There's a lot of people, you know, a lot, a lot of people are doing it. But I just thought everybody would want to do that in terms of like, instead of spending all this money to go to a, you know, a particular thing, I'm not condemning. I'm not saying it. I think it's great. I think they should do all of it. I just felt that one, your point that you're making is exactly what I'm experiencing right now in another way. And I got si blindsided by that. I couldn't believe that that was like, why would you want to spend all this more money to go sit in the thing? But it's already yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> so 
Uh, well, what I've hmm. what I've gathered, um, and it's a strange concept for me personally. Um, and as you know, and lots of people know, I'm pretty humble about this. I don't I don't want to step into those shoes or fit into that persona of of a celebrity trainer, celebrity detailer. It just it doesn't fit for me. But I'm always curious why. You know, why did you spend all this time watching all these videos and learning from these videos? They tell me, hey, I I learned how to polish cars from watching you and Larry and Kevin on videos. I'm like, cool, that's awesome. That helps me. That makes me feel good that mm -hmm. we helped somebody learn a skill. Sure. But then why are you here? <laughs> why are you at this event with 150 I, I touch other you. people? <laughs> boop, boop. <laughs> Boop. <laughs> and it, it goes back to just the human connection, the yeah. human, you know, they just want to, uh, to them, and this is explained to me because I honestly didn't understand it. To them, watching all those videos and watching us in, on camera and YouTube videos, that made them want the personal experience even more. Mm -hmm. I can appreciate that. Of, connect live yeah that, I, I i get that i i didn't yeah. realize that i get that now i guess in short if i had put a training seminar together that had nothing really to do with polishing is I, I gave you the course jordan gave you the course by now right i don't know i have a bunch of emails all right well whatever he sent you the me. access to the course to check it out but some of it um, is about polishing and going through the actual techniques with you and kevin yeah. the whole thing like hey what are some mistakes yeah, yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> but most of it is about you know, actually how to go home with dollars in your pocket. I mean, I love detailing. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It's the greatest thing yeah. in the world. But at the end of the day, I got to pay for college and, you know, put food on the table, blah, blah, blah. So I, I'm just, I was baffled that uh, people were more interested. Like if I were to open up, say, hey, we're going to do some training and I'll basically do everything I've ever done in any of the videos, but we can do it together. Or I'm going to show you new stuff that no one really talks about and it's half half as expensive or half the price or whatever. Yeah. We're going to do the same stuff that, that I was like, Oh, all right. I, it's not right or wrong. I just, I was totally blind. I had no idea that yeah. there was yeah. the draw for that. So maybe one day I'll be able to do that. But well, I, 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 wanna... I think both are important. I yeah. think the online opportunity and then the face to face, I think they're both important. At least that's what they're telling me is it's important to them mm -hmm. that they, they have access to both you know, um, digital online data and content. And then also the personal experience seems to be of high value to a lot of people. I, I know it because I travel around the world and lots of people show up and it's so strange. Like you and I did the Norway thing. And mm. that was an example in our industry of the, the largest event in the world, in our industry. That I of, of, Detailers coming together, over 400 people. And, and if you think of that, all it was, the content we delivered, I mean, you gave a, a keynote speech, which was, you know, about the business side and stuff like that. But during the day, the content was exactly what I would teach at my academy if I had four people and I'm showing you how to polish paint. The content, it literally was a class on how to polish car paint. And over 400 people from 22 countries. And we did it in a parking garage too, by the way. Remember yeah. we did it under the, in, in we, the parking garage? That was the first time. I have to tell you something. This is a crazy story. That was the first time. You know, it was cool, like the drive clean and people, you know, when I go to the grocery store or whatever, my wife, you know, like, hey, I'm like, oh, hey, man, thanks for watching. You know, I kind of had a whatever. You know, I, not, I'm not saying I used to. I'm trying to be real. I was like, I love it. I think it's great. I'm, I'm cool with it. I'm like, ah, yeah. When I went to Norway, that was by far. Far the first time I always ever was like, oh this shit this is real like I don't know what's what? going like I had to have people walk with me in the room it, to get to one I'm not joking oh, but, oh I, I was yeah, I was yeah. going like they're like ah I was like looking around I was like did Mick Jagger show up like what is going it was really that <laughs> yeah. I and I'm not saying that to be funny or to be boastful it no, no, was no. legit I was like this yeah. I've never seen anything like that those guys make us look like we don't even spit on our cars i mean they're nuts over yeah. there in a good way they were amazing yeah, right right fun times over Strangest there deal. but what it does is it speaks to the the power and the you know the enthusiasm of people that want that passionate connection with 
uh, you know, quote unquote leaders of our industry and right. other people that are kind of guiding the way. Um, it's fascinating to me. I'm uh, every time it happens and it happened, to the, you know, I spent the entire month in Southeast Asia bouncing around from Island to Island and we where had, specifically, uh, Oh, Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines in one trip, all one trip. It oh, took a month. My own. And we bounced around and did events and hundreds of people showed up and um, And what happened? Just you were very, saying something. It's, huh? You were saying something, I interrupted you. I just didn't know where you were. Uh, Southeast Asia well, is pretty it, big. I, what I was getting to was it's it, I'm still trying to personally understand the response that I personally get when I travel around and hundreds of people show up and and when you ask them you know, because I'm there, uh, my mind is I'm serious about education and I'm going to teach you something. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm going to teach you something that helps you achieve your life goals and your business goals. And I'm serious about that. That's that's why I show up. If you ask them, why did they show up? I came here to see you. Really? I came I came here to listen to you talk. And I I just, I mean, I've been doing this for 25 plus years and I still have a hard time with that answer because I, I put, I spin it around and I think of my, my own perspective. And I think in what, in what area of my life would I take the time and the money and the, the travel and to buy into an event, go somewhere hmm. to sit down and listen to somebody talk about a topic? I don't, I don't have too many topics I would do that for and yeah. I don't have I don't have too many people I would I would say I'm paying to listen to you talk. I personally don't have that. I don't have that in my life. So I can't relate to it. It's very strange. Well, guess what, Baba? People do. People yeah. do. So that that's awesome. You are you are certainly helping people. I, I certainly me. I I've learned a whole lot from, you know, sanding and doing all this stuff in the, in the beginning. Um, with, with the, with the three amigos, you know, Derek, Kevin, and, and, and yeah. you there. So, um, it's, it's powerful. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I'm grateful that, uh, we've known each other this long and, and you were kind enough to come on the podcast. Um, I'm trying to get back into the, uh, the podcast world here. We have like a legit foot of snow outside right now. So it's a perfect time for our, uh, a podcast. So podcast, yeah. I was like, I think we're good. Cause I can't like really move cars out. Otherwise they get gross. You know, yeah, right. I, to, I can't even yeah, back yeah. it out right now. So um, I thought uh, good timing timing would be good. I appreciate you. We're, we're uh, up to our hour here. This was very unexpected uh, and, and amazing to hear all the, the stories and certainly the growth from where you were to uh, where you are now is amazing. And, and all the uh, if you think about all the people that you've affected and certainly the not even like, ah, oh, you made them a better detailer, which is admirable as it is. I think you've made people. Um, and I don't want to say this in a, in a crass way. You've made people able to be uh, supportive to their family. In other words, they've made money yeah. based on and, making detail, you know, detailing. And that's what means more to me now. I mm. was saying this to a group um, in Southeast Asia, and I'll close with this kind of comment. But, mm. So there was a time in my early parts of my career where I genuinely cared about shiny cars, and I genuinely cared about you know, helping other people learn the skills to make shiny cars. Mm -hmm. But honestly, nowadays, I could care less. I could care less if the universe has more shiny cars. I really don't. I got to the point where I don't really care about that. But what means the most to me is, like you said, which is helping people get the skills to do things better and faster and, and to be efficient and profitable. Why? not to make shiny cars, more of those in the universe. It's to help their life. It's to help them have a better life. And it goes back to, I mean, it's odd odd that I shared this in the podcast about my history with the truck being stolen and all that. But what that means to me now, fast forward 20 years later, um, I just want to help people get to their success plateau and their profitability so that they can achieve their, you know, what they really want out of life, you know, get the good stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to help them do that. And I want to help them do it in a, in a better and faster way than I did. Cause it, my learning curve was, you know, 
years to learn how to detail. Like yours, you started out and a lot of what you know, Larry, was self-taught in the beginning. Because mm-hmm. there was not the there was no YouTube that are available right now. Yeah, there was no yeah, YouTube. There's, <laughs> <not then. laughs> there was no YouTube. Well, I'm happy to so, say this then uh, to you directly as we end. You have been successful, my friend, because you've made a lot of people uh, be able to pay their bills and, and support their family and whatnot. So your mission so. Uh, is successful. Now you just have to continue... Uh, like I say, pumping the water out of the ground. I mean, you already found the well. You're killing it. So I just keep bringing, just pump more water out, and you, you know, uh, you know, well, feed, thank you for feed more people. So appreciate you being on. Um, I feel like I need to go take a. If, if I smoke, my mom was going. If I, if I smoke, <laughs> they would be like, <laughs> I don't. But that she always says that like, as a joke. You know, like, yeah. I need to take a shower or something. I'm like, oh, this is getting emotional. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. So. <laughs> On that note, thank you very much. I will do, uh, by okay. the way, if you're listening, we'll do, I'm going to uh, wrench his arm, but he's always been a good sport about it. We'll do more um, podcasts with, with just uh, Jason, with Kevin and Jason, with, with Jason, Kevin and Derek. We'll, we'll do a bunch more things. The, the, the God's awesome. honest yeah, truth is I'm still trying to figure out this program because it's all fancy and I got, you know, I'm still doing the, I'm still trying to figure out how to do all these buttons and whatnot right. over here. So as I get a little better, um, well, you did, you did great with me. You didn't like accidentally disconnect me or something. <laughs> Who knows if we're even recording right now? That's kind of the fun. <laughs> I'm like constantly looking at the screen over here on the left. going like, Oh God, it says recording a hundred. Uh, it says one hour and six minutes. Please, please don't blow yeah. my computer up. But, um, anyhow, <laughs> thank, thank you, you very I much. Yeah. We'll talk soon. Uh, as always guys, thanks for listening and, uh, we'll be back soon. Bye-bye.